Okay, so hi everyone here on our side and hi everyone virtually in Zoom and also um, in presence in Weimar. Um, yeah, thanks for attending this lab session today. A uh, quick introduction of myself. I'm Niklas, I'm a PhD student and research assistant uh, at the text mining and retrieval chair in uh, Leipzig here. Um, I have a bit of a um, computer vision background. So um, this was where I first came in contact with deep learning. And now here and in this session today, I'm gonna apply this uh, with you together to um, yeah, some text-based problems rather than images. So um, the plan for this lab today is the following. We will first do a quick recap. Uh, so that you here um, get back to um, what we've been looking at last week or what Lucas prepared. There's a small erratum also, uh, we'll cover that. Then I give a quick motivation why we are doing all those things that we're doing today, especially considering that we basically covered the whole pipeline last week, right? We did everything that we would have to do in order to successfully use Keras to train a model, but there's more. And um, those topics go very much in depth and in detail. And I will have to motivate very carefully why we are doing this or else you won't believe that this is important. But um, yeah, in contrast to last week, I will also try to do this a bit more interactive. So while well, last week we had to be quite fast to cover lots of topics in a quick time, this time, yeah, there'll be some mumbling sessions where you can join up with your neighbor, seat neighbor, or um, yeah, you virtually can also participate and um, solve some exercises in the notebooks. I think it should be available for download on the website right now. Great, then it worked. And um, yeah, also some fun activities there where you dice out or, or randomize the task that you will be solving. So. Be excited for that. Okay, let's start. So here you can see last week's um, notebook and we have a look, quick look at what we've been doing. So the main concept was um, to give you a quick in introduction into dataset processing. Here we used the IMDB dataset, IMDB reviews. I think you all remember we had um, labels that denoted the sentiment, positive, negative. And if you remember, we did a very extensive and yeah, lengthy pre-processing and cleaning of the data and setting everything up. Uh, complicated loops here, reading some files, uh, using even pandas um, yeah, to set everything up as a tabular form, to explore the data, check it out. Then we did a trained test split. Um, this is probably the very most important part of last week for you to understand that the train test split is not given, but something that you have to do yourself and have to do very, very carefully. So um, when we are reviewing papers, for example, and there's something wrong with the train, train test split, we call this train test leakage, then this is quick and strong reject. So um, also maybe keep that in mind for the projects at the end of the semester, but um, no worries, we'll have a closer supervision there at this point. Yeah, what did we do here? We used uh, Keras sequential um, to build a simple neural network, um, really not optimized to do anything, but rather this, just to show you, okay, we can put something in and it works. We ex exposed you to activation functions, I did a bit of dropout, also, um, yeah, the classic dense layer, I think every one of you, you already knew, you know what this model summary does. We had a quick look at this optimization that's taking place here with Adam. We had metrics, we had callbacks, um, checkpointing even early stopping, very nice. And then we finally trained the model and has this, yeah, rather um, flat looking uh, training output. We'll definitely enhance this this time, yeah, and the evaluation. And we did a quick exploration there on, on what we could do with the data and why it might, might be, um, or why the model might not be working as it is. 
And um, there was, so there was one flaw, I think, uh, that Lucas already fixed. And I think he talked already about it uh, at another um, session. Um, there was a padding missing in the uh, test data or the validation data. So this is why at some occasions there might have been weird things going on on the model, but this should be fixed now in the solution also. Thank you. And also this thing here, which I again find very important. I talked about this train test leakage thing. Leakage thing. And uh, one aspect is that you must not do any kind of training on test data, obviously. But um, this also includes tokenization. So defining the tokens that you will use in order of the process also means that you must not use any training data. And we did it here, not quite correct, but um, I mean, in the end, uh, you would have to have replaced the missing tokens from the train or from the validation data set with unknown special tokens. So would everything be fine? But yes, Martin. Can I ask one question? Uh, you said you must not use any training data, but you meant you must not use any test. Sorry, yeah. Okay, yeah. Martin said, uh, I will repeat quickly. Thank you. Um, I messed something up. Yeah, obviously, you train on the train data, but must not use any test data for training. Yes, thank you for this important point. Okay, so this pretty much concludes the sum up um, for this part. I open up the notebook already for today's course. Um, you can also do it at home again, just uh, in your pace, no problem. I added uh, pretty much everywhere where it's not self-explanatory comments. So um, feel free to repeat everything. Um, but I, first, as announced, I wanted to motivate a bit um, what we're doing today. So the first large concept that I will introduce is the concept of TF data data sets. And the question now is whether anyone of you have ever used TF data data sets. Maybe we use the raise hands feature in Zoom and also you can raise your hands um, here if anyone has used it. Okay, three, four, five, six people are showing their hands here. I cannot, how can I see it in here? Ah, Benno was his hand. <laughs> Very nice. Okay, also a similar amount of people, and I think maybe in Weimar there are also some people there um, that have used it. So for all the others, a bit of an explanation why you would you would use this. Last week, I mean, it worked last week, right? We had uh, the data set, we imported it from a compressed file, we passed it into uh, a special array data type, which was the NumPy ND array data type. And then we could pass it to all the relevant Keras fitting functions. Uh, it all worked very fine. We had a well-defined shape that we could use. Now, why would we use just another huge concept, TF data data sets? Well, there are very many um, concepts that are implemented on those data sets that would be quite hard to implement on ND arrays. And maybe let's do this together with you. Just shout at me all the things you would hope to have implemented, pre-implemented for data set handling, which we last week had to do manually. Just maybe or, um, also here online, you can just um, unmute yourself maybe and, and shout at me your ideas. What would you expect from a data set format? What would be useful for you? Anyone here maybe? Any ideas what, what would be useful? I mean, we did some processing last week, right? Maybe this could be useful to have it in a generalized form. So the classical uh, way of approaching this, I think I also had this in a similar fashion in the requirements questionnaire um, that you all did prior to the semester, uh, map and filter. Um, Maybe you already know what this is. If not, we'll do this again today on the TF data data sets. But what are other things that you would like to have, especially in the context of machine learning on your data sets?
normalization, yeah, good idea, which would imply that you do it on some kind of sub data set, which you could call batch. So the first thing that would come in mind there, thanks, for, would be batching. So batching was quite yeah, difficult to do or quite yeah, manual um, when we did it last week. But here, um, batching is very well defined. Um, other ideas other than batch? Splitting. Splitting, yeah, thank you. I really hope that this question or this idea would come up because I want you to understand that this is intentionally not supported by TF data data sets. So everything else you could have mentioned, I will also continue with the list here, um, is implemented. Yeah, Niklas, I have also a wish. I, yes, Benno, I would like to have random selection. Yeah, random selection. This is a good point. We've come to that, but explicitly not splitting because um, yeah, it, it's a different concept. You have to be very careful when splitting up a data set and it's not supported because um, yeah, taking, taking a data set and splitting it up into to, yeah, train a test set is supposed to be done more carefully than just by applying a TensorFlow function. And also at the end of this lab, you will all understand why this would be quite hard to do with TF data data sets quick hint or quick spoiler, because they support infinite data sets or very, very large data sets where you don't even know how large they are. Okay, so I teasered it already. TF data data sets are mainly used for those purposes where your memory is simply too small to handle anything using ND arrays. And um, I mean, this is the whole context of this semester, right? Big data and language technologies. So will definitely in your projects come to the point where neither your memory on your hardware will be sufficient to fit all the data at once, but also not our cluster, which was quite impressive, but it's not feasible. So um, this forces you actually to use TF data data sets. So um, yeah, other stuff that I wanted. Uh, so I said map and filter. Yes, batch, we had this. Padding would also be nice, right? Um, we did this last time um, and we also have to do it this time because when you work on GPU, then you want to fit everything in a structured data format where all the batches have identical size or are processed identically and you need a batch. And we have this too in uh, TF data data sets in combination with a batch. Shuffling, this is quite similar to what uh, Benno, I think it was Benno from the audio, um, suggested. Um, repeating, also very important because sometimes you want to uh, work with a data set on, yeah, on multiple epochs. So you want to pass the, uh, the data set to your training function multiple times in a row. And I also have a fun activity planned there. So we all discover the functionality of repeat. Something else that I find quite important and interesting also for you is persistence. So some way of storing stuff. I mean, this is easy with uh, NumPy arrays or ND arrays, but at the point uh, that I already announced where <laughs> your memory is simply too small to fit the data set, you will have to come up with other means than um, yeah, simply saving one array with all the data. And I also have this as a task here. Iteration, the very, very most basic feature you would have over a data set. Yes, uh, Martin? Is it possible to show that this inviting? So that yeah, yeah we, I, can, I can show the list. You can follow uh, what we have heard. That's a good uh, uh, good point. Um, but it's in a... I mean, ah, I have to. Taking notes, so no, <laughs> no, no um, I will also append this to, to the notebook and also we have the recording. So, um, but the question is how can I? Uh, no, no, no problem. But I think, yeah, I also find it very important to read uh, what I'm hearing. So, um, this is the list I'm reading out right now. But um, so we had map filtering. This was how far I got. Uh, persistence iteration, the very most basic feature um, you could imagine from 
a data set. There are also more fancy iteration methods on Chief Data data sets, which includes um, um, yeah, iterating at a non-predefined order, so a non-deterministic order. This is quite useful when you want to relax this condition of determinism, um, because this actually increases the speed on parallelist hardware by a lot. From generators, so you want to have some way to generate the data set from other data. We will have this as a quick ex exercise. And interleaving, we will also encounter this as a small section, but interleaving basically means mingling two data sets or more data sets together. And this is also the core aspect of a pipeline that I will introduce much later in the semester, where we use CPU hardware, to generate individual data sets and then mix them all up or interleave them, as one could say, into one large GPU processable data set. And also prefetching and caching, which also enhances the speed, increases the speed. Um, but it's quite hard to fine tune. I also included in later in the semester, um, in the plan, I included a way that we could profile whether prefetching and catching are useful, are working by checking out the memory that we use and the throughput on the GPU. But it's a bit fragile and I didn't include it in the program for today. But we have no native train test split. Um, this is the most important point. So thank you for, for bringing it up quite early. And the main advantage why we are also presenting this and not another data set management system is um, close integration with Chaos. So we can all use it natively and um, yeah, we'll see how this will go. Um, okay, so we'll jump right in. Feel free to run those uh, cells together with me. I will also restart my kernel here so we can all start fresh. First, let's do the setup. Um, import TensorFlow and NumPy as usual. Now, the first point where it might get interesting is that today we'll be using the same, the very same data set that Lucas used, but we'll be re reusing none of his code because the data set is so common that it actually has this its own, its very own Keras integration. So we just call this function here. This is also uh, contained in your um, non-solved version. Um, and yeah, just load it up. But um, one, one thing is a bit important about this um, Keras dataset integration of IMDB. It's already pre-tokenized. So the words are already tokenized. We don't have to do that anymore. And as you can see here, um, it's already trained test splitted. So we don't have to do that either. Martin, yes. So this is another solution to the tokenizer problem. Use an external tokenizer. Yeah, use an external so tokenizer, <laughs> use something someone else did. But sorry? Ah, sorry, yeah. Uh, um, okay. Martin said, Martin said um, this is another important um, solution for tokenization. Just use a pre built tokenizer. And maybe thanks for building that bridge because um, in the week after Easter holidays, um, we'll probably come to that also when um, Chris will help us introduce uh, Hugging Face um, models and data sets. And they have this as a core aspect uh, providing pre world tokenizers. So you don't have to do that anymore. But yeah, this index form um, tells this tokenizer where to start with the indices and the rest is um, yeah some some special tokens that we can assign later we'll do that in a minute and number of words we have to delimit this somewhere or else um, if we try to pass this into a network the shapes would just get uh, way out of hand or, or the values might get way out of hand and the rest is simply replaced by the unknown special token Okay, you can run this along with me. And here's the first exercise. I think we'll probably do this together in a minute and then um, an error will occur. I can promise that much. And then we can together try to solve the error by investigating what's happening here. So um, 
yeah, let's convert uh, X train samples back to strings. We have to do something here. We have to import um, or, or use an external index here because, as I said, it's pre tokenized. So we somehow have to access the tokenizer. And um, the problem is that this word index actually um, yeah, transforms uh, not a token into a word, but rather a word into a token. So we have to invert it. And I will do it a way that I really enjoy, which is dictionary comprehensions. I think you already saw that when you did the questionnaire that I quite enjoy this. Um, so when we write a dictionary comprehension, of course, we type the dictionary brackets, and then uh, we iterate over the dictionary items. So I also, also asked you for ways to iterate a dictionary. If you remember in the questionnaire, this is one of them. You could also iterate the values or the keys directly, or if you don't append anything like this, it will automatically um, iterate over the keys. Okay, and then we just revert it, right? Uh, um, and this is just the inverse, inverted word index. Okay, now I asked you or myself to explore the first three samples. So let me quickly write up a loop here. And the decoded, decoded sequence is uh, a space joint list. or iterator in this case, because I didn't use a list comprehension brackets, of um, the inverted word index for the index that we get from the train example. Right, the ith one, so we are iterating over the first three ones. And yeah, I'm now simply copy and pasting the print code because I don't have to explain you, you just see what it does here. So it first prints out the label and the decoded label here. We take this from Y train and also the decoded sequence. Now take a moment to read this text and then tell me what went wrong. Or maybe tell me what went right. So what's working, what's not working. I mean, the code is correct. It has no error, compiles fine, works. Yes. I assume that the tokenizer is different vocabulary or that maybe shifted it so that the identification between tokens and the word is incorrect. Okay, thank you. I repeat that. Uh, so the idea was that the tokenizer uses um, a different or shifted vocabulary. So the matching up between the word and the tokenizer is uh, or the word and or the token and the token ID is um, or index is not correct. But let's get back to the other question, what's working? What can we see here? So, I mean, it reads like, like a natural text, right? So um, some, something feels right. It's not random gibberish, not random tokens. And this actually helped me debug this uh, when I was creating the example. Uh, and I was not the only one having this issue because formally this is the way you would do it. Well, if you um, if you read over the text, then you notice that it feels right to con or uh, the the amount of stop words and the placement of the stop words feels somehow natural. So, for example, the number of short words in in the sentences, so very frequent words, is in a natural fashion. And this led me to the conclusion that there is a very small offset in the tokenizer, actually, or in the tokenizer dictionary, which means that maybe the most frequent word gets interchanged with the second most frequent word, for example. And very infrequent words like this powerful or themselves uh, get somehow messed up with other infrequent words. And yeah, turns out this is actually the case. There was an offset that we didn't consider. And this offset is this index from up here. So you were actually absolutely right. This is the whole issue. But 
my issue when I programmed this was that this index form is actually the default value and I didn't even supply it. So I didn't supply it, but it somehow <laughs> created a default index form value that was passed to the function. So we could have no idea. But this is the learning I want you to get out of this. Be sure that the tokenizer and the tokenizer index align, um, else it won't work. And I quickly um, changed up this example so it will work. And also in the solution that I provide you in the end, uh, you can see, find both versions, uh, one naive and the one fixed I'm working at right now. So as you can see here, this is the offset. We have to yeah, calculate back in. And now the question is, what should we do with the special tokens, like the three special tokens, one, two, and three, and also the special token zero, which yeah, is simply defined as the padding value by, um, by definition or by... Um, yeah, by definition. And that's all we have to do. So we add um, the, the dictionary of new or, or special tokens using this uh, dictionary join operator that you maybe don't know because it's quite new in Python. But if we run this again here, then we can see uh, we have the special token with the token number one, this film was just brilliant casting, unknown, unknown, story direction, unknown, really. So it works, right? Um, we fixed this, and um, so the takeaway basically is at least do this verification if you ever use a pre-built tokenizer, or else um, in the end when you pass uh, an untokenized text and have to tokenize it yourselves, it won't work. So now, Let's dive into this TF data data sets. And um, this is the part where you'll be doing something rather than me typing it up front. So um, I linked for all those functions that you might not know yet, I linked the docs. So feel free to check it right now also on your laptops. Um, here I wrote again that TF data data sets I used to, oh, you can, yeah, you can see my cursor, but the other cursor is disturbing. Better? Yeah. Um, data data sets are used to represent large data sets. And um, yeah, here you will do it yourself. So please, yeah, take a, take a minute with your neighbor, maybe that's allowed, totally fine. And um, try solving that problem. So this would be the point where you would get out your laptops if you didn't have yet and do this. Take, your few, take a few minutes and then I start programming and you can also join or still continue doing your thing. And maybe in the end later when you get more time from me and um, in order to prevent you being bored <laughs> if you're too fast, I also will provide you with bonus exercises. Uh, you'll see that. Okay, maybe let me ask for some feedback from Weimar. Are people starting to work? Is everything working or did I mess something up? Oh, okay, this is muted somehow. Okay, um, we only have two laptops here, so um, not too interactive. Okay, thanks for the feedback, yeah.
So as you're working right now, I will slowly provide you with hints um, to get started if you're still stuck. So um, yeah, I asked you to use TF data datasets from generator, which somehow implies that you will have to define a generator. And uh, to recall, uh, recall what, what a generator is, this is a function that uses a yield statement in Python. So um, yeah, you yield all the samples and this also means that you want to have some kind of loop in the data set, uh, in, in the generator, which loops over X and Y at the same time. And if you think about how to, how to do that, then you come across the SIP statement, I think. So please try that one minute and then I'll paste it here. Okay, I will start and uh, just interrupt me if there's anything weird going on, but also just continue coding along. And I could also imagine going around here in the room in, in Leipzig and you maybe also in, in Weimar and um, helping you if you're stuck on, on later tasks. And we could also in the end uh, have you screen share again from your laptops. So um, you can join the Zoom session and screen share to all of us if there's any question or you found this especially clever solution. Um, I'm also very curious about that. Okay, so I think that was the easy part that you should have gotten, even if you never saw anything related to this data set, chief data data set uh, class. Um, I quickly add the generator for the test here, um, but this won't work. So I can try it, but oh, maybe it works, but yeah, it, it's not, it would be not nice if it worked. So um, actually this is not enough to design a data set format. You also have to provide some kind of type specification because in Python generators can yield any kind of stuff um, that's probably not safe for using in a TF data data sets. Uh, this is why you will have to provide some kind of type specification, some kind of constraint. The traditional method would be providing a shape and a data type. I also prompted you in the questionnaire at the beginning, so you all should know what this is. But we will not use that. We will use the fancy way, uh, the fancy modern way of providing output signature. I, I wrote it at the top, yeah. Um, I'll define it in a minute. And the nice thing about it, this output signature is that it's quite flexible. You can also uh, or even define output signatures as a dictionary signature, as a dictionary, for example, of yeah, train or, or, or rather x. Doo -doo -doo. 
and why did it do? We'll not do that here, but um, this is even also possible and will be used later in this course. But uh, here we'll use the simple way that is also very Keras friendly, and this is having a tuple of X and Y, just as I announced at the top here. But now we have to define the specifications of those. And this again uses um, yeah, the traditional way oops, of uh, providing a shape and a, a data type. So for our X values, the shape is none, which means um, yeah, we have a length of, um, of the text. So the text consists of some number of tokens. But this is not even um, uh, padded yet, right? So this is a racked type where each sample has a different length. And we can simply express this by none. And for the Y, it's very similar. Here we simply take, uh, maybe add a line break here. Um, we'll simply take the um, yeah, empty shape I think if you worked with NumPy before, then you will all have seen this. This is just a scalar value and not even a one dimensional one shape scalar value. So some kind of array with one element. No, it's a really native scalar. Um, this is just the label for one sample. And we also define it as an integer. Okay, very good. Let's execute that. And we don't know whether it worked yet, but I also included this test function here because, uh, as I mentioned, one of the primitives we want to have on data sets is iteration. So we just iterate it. We have an iterator, and uh, we can call the next operator on this iterator, which gives us the first element. So um, yeah, it looks a bit weird with the zoom level here, but um, yeah, you basically have one large text consisting of token indices and over here the label one. Okay, let's let that sink in for a minute or a second and I ask you whether there are any questions. Yeah, ah, sure, yeah, sorry, good point. Uh, yeah, maybe I can also add more line breaks here, so it will be more readable. Uh, maybe I can also expand the window a bit. Ah, better. Yeah, yeah. Then I have less space to read, but I should know what I'm doing. So, ah, people are commenting in the chat. I did not check the chat. Maybe Lucas, you can. It was just the perfect. Okay. Thanks. And there's another question: uh, What represented the shape B, uh, empty shape in the uh, uh, part of the signature? Well, um, so okay. I, I guess I, I would interpret the question as what this would mean. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thanks for. The question I repeated quickly, what does this empty shape mean? Um, I repeat this again, it's just a scalar value. So um, no array, nothing, just a fixed uh, space data, which just incorporates one, in this case, 32-bit uh, integer. Thank you for the question. OK, so we let this sink in, and no questions arise. That's Good. Yeah, Lucas, have it. Um, we tried to rejoin it. It's not the corals anymore. But I think only this step. <laughs> yeah, I can do it quickly. So um, some Zoom issues where Michael will be made co-host again, if I can do it. There he is. Okay. Okay, let's continue. So we have a nice data set here, and this will be the foundations of the operation that we will do uh, starting from now. So I already promised you that I really enjoy persistence and uh, that persistence is the key to doing reproducible research. So we'll do that here, or 
rather you will do that here. It's four lines of code, so please do it. Please check the docs um, and implement this. And for those of you who are quick and um, would like to do something else or something more, try to read a bit into this TF record format. This is the traditional method of uh, saving data sets in TensorFlow. It's, uh, it's not comfortable to use. So uh, it's, it's quite tricky because you have to be, or to make very sure that you understand the serialization and deserialization methods and don't mess up the data types there. But otherwise, it's uh, quite nice to use because it provides you in the end with a file that's um, yeah, cross-platform shareable. And um, yeah, also because there's a limit, limited support of, of uh, data types that you can use there, which makes it quite easy to be compatible. <laughs> but um, yeah, you have to think a little to do it. But on the end, there's this chief data experimental save and load which is still at the moment in the experimental phase, but I think this will slowly um, also be merged into the TensorFlow main branch because it's quite future-proof in my opinion. But please try it out and see how easy it is in reality. Okay, so thank you all here for um, checking out the docs and um, starting to implement this. I will also catch up now. Um, yeah, it's, it's really so easy to use once you uh, understand how it works. Experimental, say, am I unmuted? Yes. Um, just input the data set, add a path. I called this. IMDB train. This is actually relative to a special location on your file system that can also be provided somewhere in the function, but it should end up in your home directory, directory with the default um, settings. In the .keras folder, I think, but we can have a look at it. Okay. Yeah, maybe it's also relative to the notebook, but um, it should be relative to the home directory. I don't know. Um, yeah, so no witchcraft here. Bam, and you have easy persistence. So really easy, but keep in mind, you don't have infinite memory. So you might want to limit persistence in the end if you have infinite data sets um, to some limited extent. 
Um, yeah, let's try to read it. Looks good, right? Yeah. Ah, no, it doesn't look good because I didn't put it somewhere. Yeah, you, of course, have to save it somewhere. And this should then override the already um, defined train data sets, test data sets. Yeah, and it still looked the same, so probably worked. Did anyone look into this TF records format? Maybe unmute yourself or here in the room. Okay, then we'll have the, this as a quick homework for you to check it out and see what other people do with this. Okay, we're getting very close to the next exercise. So um, I'm all still at those primitives that I talked about for TF data data sets. And now we have map and filter, but we couldn't come up with a nice example for um, uh, uh, for, for map, so um, we just want you to implement the filter operation here. Um, yeah, one other thing, but I'll talk about this when I'm implementing this for you here, is the t-function decorator. So maybe you can use the time now to think about what a decorator in Python was again, but I'll explain it to you then in a minute. And your task is on the train data set to filter out all reviews that are too short to be useful for training. That's the intuition here. Um, probably you wouldn't do this in reality um, because it's discarding of, of valuable training data, but let's do that here. So yeah, check out in the docs how filtering is defined or how filtering works and apply it to the data set that you have here. Yeah, also for those of you who are quick, here's the promised bonus task using flat map. I will also explain this to you what flat map does. Um, it sounds quite similar to um, map, but it actually rather some kind of inverse filter. But um, I'll come to that in a minute. Okay, I will start now. If no one tells me that you want more time, but maybe we can also code along then. So it's it's not that complicated. Um, this is just to encourage you to, to keep trying to implement those methods. Um, 
So we override the train data set here by applying some kind of filter. And we provide a filter function, which we will define now. It takes, um, it actually, yeah, takes one value, which is the sample, but we have some implicit unpacking here where we have X and Y samples. So we can quickly use this here. I think in the questionnaire, there were also some implicit and explicit unpacking questions. So uh, take a look back at the questionnaire if something there is unclear for you and then use that to do some research. Maybe that's a good idea. Um, so yeah, we basically return an altered, uh, or no, no, sorry, we return a Boolean value that indicates whether we want, want to keep that sample or not. So uh, as I demanded over here, we want to keep that sample if it's longer or equal than 100 tokens. So we have some kind of comparison here. And for that, we have to take the shape of X or the size. Um, we use TF shape here. Um, to be honest with you, I always mess up the, uh, the type of TF shape. If you enable either, either eager execution in TensorFlow, it might be a bit different, but here it's a special tensor data type. So it's not that flexible as you would wish, but we have to remember the shape is always um, a list or a tuple, so um, integral that data type, and we would like to take the first or the index zero element here, uh, even though there's only one element in the shape array, but well, we have to do that. And this should already probably work well. Uh, I did a typo here. Yeah, it works already. But we forget, forgot something that I was encouraging you to do, but forgetting it is mostly probably fine because TensorFlow is clever and add this in the end um, to your code again uh, internally. But I want you to explicitly use tier function as a decorator here. So this add um, symbol means we add a decorator. So um, this whole function gets passed through tier function first before it's defined. And what this does is it actually allows to um, yeah, add the method to the computation graph. And uh, in the end, this is for loading up all those uh, operations onto your GPUs. So you are kind of on a very, very high level and very abstractly programming your GPU by simply writing Python code and doing this um, decorator there. But there's a caveat, of course, uh, you can do this with everything. So loops are kind of supported sometimes, but probably mostly not. You will see this later when we do some weird aggregator co uh, code to just avoid using loops. Uh, if is also a bit tricky and all more advanced control statements, generators, for example, won't work at all. So you will have to come up with some clever solutions. I mean, the alternative would be writing GPU code or CUDA code directly. So I think we can all still be quite happy with what we have there. But um, yeah, we have to have to do it this way. And it works. Great. So now, now about this flat map. So map should be pretty clear. The basic map, you just apply it over the data set. And for each sample in the data set, you apply a function and you swap that sample out for the modified version that you pass through the mapping function. That's some kind of one-to-one -one relation there. So um, yeah, if you input a data set with the cardinality 100, then you will st still um, be given a data set with cardinality 100. Filter actually um, modifies the cardinality because um, yeah, it has the ability at least to reduce the number of um, samples in your data set. But flat map does kind of the opposite, as I already mentioned, because it can blow up your data set and actually add more samples than you already had. Um, so it converts one sample into 
possibly multiple samples. And we also, also use that later in the semester. This is why I included this here for you to see. Um, it's no longer used in the rest of the course, so you don't have to really um, type this down now, but um, at least I want to want you to try to understand what I'm doing here. So again, I'm, oh, is it? No, I think it's not, it's not used. I mean, we apply it to the train data set here and override it, but it should work without. So um, yeah, we again, Right, train data set equals train data set flat map this time with a map, mapping function. Again, this implicit unpacking here. And now it gets a bit messy because what we have to return is um, a data set. So for each sample that we put in, we return a data set. And then in the end, these data sets get concatenated together into a large data set. Um, so those cannot be infinite, else it wouldn't work. Then you have to use some kind of interleaving structure. But uh, yeah, here we have to somehow convert this one X into X's and this one Y into Y's. And for this, I use the following code. You have the size here, again, just like we did above. But then I did a um, yeah, kind of TF range tensor, which goes from zero to the, um, yeah, basically the size, but rounded down to the next 100. Because we only want, or we want to discard everything that's a bit longer than those um, 100 or 200 or 300 tokens. So if someone wrote 305 tokens, we want to discard those five. And this is what this line does. And this range object then gets reshaped into a shape that's very useful for us to, um, to read the data out. So we get, um, yeah, for example, here, two or three lines of 100 long token sequences. So yeah, 200 range object would get converted to two times 100. And then we use yeah, some kind of tensor indexing operation. So if you're confident with NumPy, um, then yeah, this is pretty much the advanced indexing that you can use in NumPy, where you can simply use arrays and the arrays as indices. This is what we do here, but we do have to do is explicitly using gather. So we get those elements here that we defined in our shape that we defined from our X. And we kind of have to do the same with our Y's, but all the Y's that we will get are identical because the label hopefully doesn't change over the course of a very long movie review. So this is what we're doing here. Just to get you a quick impression, feel free to have a look at um, at the solution slides or our notebook afterwards. And yeah, here we can see the results. So from one very long review, we got to, in this case, three not so long, 100 long reviews. Oh no, actually it's two, because this over here is already the next review, which you can see by the changed label here. So the rest probably got discarded from this um, review over here, which should somehow be this long. Okay. Let's have that sink in again. And I'll ask whether you have any questions. Maybe you should show the code actually. Okay, yeah, thank you. The question was, why do we do this reshape again? So um, our gather um, inherits the shape or, or the result of this gather inherits the shape of our indices. And um, we want to end up with a shape that's yeah, some kind of this shape. So um, 100 long elements, this is here in the end. And yeah, uh, how many lines 
that many lines that are we confidently able to fill, which is this uh, integer division here. But um, yeah, we have to apply this to our um, index and then apply the index using getter. Maybe you could also apply this reshape later. This would probably also work, but it's, yeah, you could try it out uh, at home, whether you could also reshape the X's instead of the R's. It probably should work, but it's always a bit cleaner or safer to do it on the R's because you could print the R's very easily and check whether this worked or not. Thank you for the question here. Yeah. Any, any other questions? Martin. So you must, everyone must be very aware the model will not read the entire input. If you say something that is count. Yeah, yeah, I, I repeat what you said. So Martin's remark was that uh, the model does not read the entire text. With that, you mean like not all 5,000 tokens that one where you are wrote. Um, probably. If you don't do it like we, we do here, because we use the cheapest text processing model available, which is just the one that uh, Lucas introduced to us last time, which is not, yeah, well, you just take one layer of every kind and then it works somehow because you do enough pooling and enough um, aggregation. But Martin is totally right that in the end, if you, if you remember maybe from your basic studies, LSTMs or, or even more basic RNNs, um, they had the, med, uh, the, the main flaw that they keep forgetting stuff that was seen first. Then people introduce bidirectional LSTMs, which means, yeah, if we keep forgetting stuff that's in the beginning, why don't we also pass the text in reverse? So also the things at the beginning seem to be somehow uh, the last things that you hear. So I think this was the intuition behind bidirectional LSTMs. Yeah, uh, Lucas is agreeing. So um, thank you for the remark. Yeah, be aware that this happens. We are introducing error. Here. Yeah. Because something could be said that validates what I have said before. Yeah, uh, uh, Martin said uh, we're introducing error here because something could be invalidated. Um, I mean, yeah, we, we are adding new labels to new positions in the text. This probably. No, this is not a problem. Of course, we want to label the entire text, but uh, if, we are, if we are discarding part of the text, it might basically contradict all that we just said before. Ah, okay. Ah, ah, ah okay. Ma I, I, I summarize what you said. If so. Propagation downward is another problem. Yeah, I see. It's not, it's not introducing at all. I see. So Martin is focusing on the discarding, actually, of the of the remainder of this modulo part. Um, yes, it's introducing error. I'll repeat what you said, and it's also um, yeah some kind of justified because we um, would not learn the whole text anyways. Okay, so I think we are not doing the whole thing today, but this should be no problem because. I can also leave the last part as a homework or quickly uh, just demonstrate what it should do. But uh, I want to do one other thing with you while you're here. And this is the, the next uh, thing. Uh, this is also the last thing I want to do with you on TF data data sets. Uh, and this is the batch shuffle and repeat um, here operation. So if you recall again what we did last time, uh, batching is quite important because you will never want to fit your whole data set into your GPU or your model at the same time. Uh, micro batching or just batching um, makes, thing, makes things work better in the end. So we have to batch. Shuffling is always nice because you don't want to always see the same batches and you also want to vary a bit in composition of the batches basically. And repetition is also important because you want to have um, multiple epochs, so multiple times seeing the whole data set in your model to make it uh, yeah, be able to adjust slowly to the data set, to fit slowly, to also get out of local, minim uh, local minima and uh, yeah, better converge to uh, global minima. So as you can see here, 
um, in this task, you will learn that the order of these operations indeed matter. So we will do the quick game I promised to you, and you will find out yourselves uh, which order is the best or the only one that works. So please do this here, execute this uh, code over here, do this random shuffle or, or random choice. And for me, this would mean uh, that I will implement first a shuffle, then a repeat, then a batch. So please, every one of you, or if you're working together with your neighbor, one of you, uh, do this random choice. And I'll be collecting the results in the end. Oh, what? yeah, collecting informally, but please let's do this. Again, to make it a bit more easy for you, I will also start coding along here. Um, but yeah, feel free to skip ahead. Yeah, maybe I should have mentioned that we're not doing this on the um, IMDB data anymore because it's quite hard to spot what's wrong there. So this is why here we created a new dummy data set, which consists out of numbers, ordered numbers. So we can very easily spot any flaws that we have here. Okay, I'll start coding. So first the shuffle, and as you already noticed, for shuffle we need to provide, um, yeah, a buffer size. But for for you all, please do it in the order that your random dice selection showed to you. Then for me, it's the repeat. I will actually do an infinite repeat, just this way, and the batch. And we again provide a batch size here. Okay, so everyone got this for their example? Great, okay, so quick evaluation code. You can also do this. Yeah, I will have to take another five minutes from you, I'm sorry, but let's finish this. Yeah, so again, we take basically uh, one whole uh, epoch there, or in this case, one batch from the epoch. And we can apply this take multiple times and we'll just, we'll just continue onward in the data set and take more and more samples. So uh, no repetition expected from there. We'll also at a new line print to just have a gap. And this is what we see in the end. Oh, I forgot the S numpy iterator. This will help us to actually view the results um, in a nicer format. Okay, so did you all do that for your examples? Then please check whether something is wrong. So I can already spoiler to you that spoil to you that there's one right combination or, or, or permutation, and the others are wrong. Um, and I also maybe ask someone from the group. Batch, shuffle, repeat. What did you ex observe? And I can also open it here. Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, so everyone else can see it. Okay, who was in that group? Batch, shuffle, re repeat. Oh, the solution is already there. Yeah, but you can see it here. What the observation? Maybe someone else from, from Rima or online wants to add something? So we 
get the first 10, like uh, they are matched in the first 10, the second 10, and the last 10 samples, always. Exactly, but okay, I repeat what you said. So they are all batched in the first 10, the second 10, and the last 10s. Yes, but is that a problem? And uh, where is the shuffling? Can, can you answer that? The, the shuffling then is there when the, the order of the 10 sets. Basically shuffling. Thank you, I repeat that. So the shuffling is there where the ordering of the 10th, uh, the 10 sets, so the batches as we could call them, is determined. So <laughs> well, the batches are shuffled in their order, but um, this doesn't help us. This is not good. Thank you very much. But but one uh, nice observations one can can make here, um, which is that uh, at least per epoch we we see each sample exactly once. And this also brings us to the observation of the next group, which is repeat shuffle batch, repeat shuffle batch. What's your observation here? Did no one roll this on the dice? Yes. Yeah, I got the same number twice. The same Thank you, exactly. So I repeat, um, we have the same numbers twice uh, in the same epoch for once, yes, but also as you mentioned in the same batch which is uh, basically a no-go. You don't want to have this. Uh, this is not intended. And this means, I also wrote it down here for you to check at home. And this means that this is wrong what we did here. So indeed for the last group, um, this is the right order, shuffle, repeat, batch, which is a bit unintuitive at first, because I mean, you would shuffle something, then you have a defined random order, and then you repeat that, doesn't that destroy shuffling? The answer is no, because the shuffling gets applied while the data still streams in. The repeat still fetches for more data and more and more, and this still gets passed through the shuffle with a continued seed and continued shuffling. So um, we don't observe what you might have expected when you got this task on your dice, uh, which would have been that, um, yeah, you get one shuffle and which is repeated all the time. No, it works quite well. So the rule of thumb actually is we apply batch on the very end and here shuffle before repeat. So I also noted that down here. So yeah, thank you for, for doing that quick task and exercise with me. Um, applying what we found out in the end is just doing what we just learned on, uh, I didn't, yeah, this is the other notebook. I cannot execute something else before I execute everything else, but trust me, it works. Um, it's also in your solutions. So here we apply what we did there. So for the buffer size, I once heard the rule of thumbs um, two times the batch size. That's reasonably good, um, even on large data sets. Okay, I think the rest we'll have to do some other time, or you can also check this out. This is not that much new if you have already checked out the docs. So this is very close to the documentations, but I would suggest to you to take this as a homework, um, start with the non-solution version, try to implement this. You will learn much out of this, especially with this custom dense layer that I wanted you to, to implement. And also the dropout layer, very interesting to again, think about what dropout is in the end. Um, Custom loss, again, maybe we'll talk about this um, at another uh, uh, lab session, but um, yeah, custom training loops is again very close to the documentation. Probably one thing that is worth most to check out for you, even if you work with predefined um, yeah, data sets and predefined models is the TensorBoard, because I think this will also be building up on this uh, when he introduces you to pre-built hugging phase models and data sets. And um, yeah, check this out, please. This is how it looks. And this is how the training actually looked for me. So looks good. Um, yeah, and this is the final assembly of everything we did on there. Everything is custom. One thing we skipped here is custom callbacks, but I think you already saw very different kind of callbacks. So, and, and the, the 
accessibility of callback um, yeah, methods is quite limited. So you're better off writing a custom training loop, which might bit feel a bit unnecessary because it's a mix in between eager execution and the TensorFlow graph model. So you have to use this weird gradient tape um, context construction here. But um, I think we'll definitely talk about this another time. Okay, so now let's have another two minutes to maybe ask some questions or think about whether you want to ask some questions right now. Lucas wants to. Um, I just want to respond to the question from the chat that I already asked in the chat that um, the flat map observation we did previously uh, does not take any semantic information about the text that you found. It's purely yeah. on the I quickly repeat what you said, even though it's in, sex, uh, in the chat, but um, so the the evaluation here is a bit dumb because it does not take any semantic information into account. It just, um, yeah, it's up everything, pulls up everything we have there. Um, definitely next time when Chris will be talking about the hugging case models, there will be much better models. Uh, and I think all of you have heard of LSTMs of transformers um, and so on, which are much more useful on text. When I was starting with um, deep learning and computer vision, there was just this convolutional network and you could do everything with it. But now in the age of attention, uh, this also gets much more interesting. So, okay, thank you all for following along and see you the next time. Yeah.